because of the Aramaic that appears in it that is possible. Like in chapter 2, all of a sudden it goes from Hebrew to Aramaic, and some think that that's just not possible. Aramaic wasn't around that early, but it turns out that there's other documents and it was. And some think that, well, there's no way that Daniel could have forecasted the things that are going to come because they, they were so specific and so true. So instead of a, approximately a 600 A.D. writing, they say, well, it must have been written in 300 A.D. Well, 60% of what he prophesied still wasn't written in 300, but he did write it in 600. So uh, if you need more help on arguing against that, uh, I can give you hours of research that you can go through that will help you. But you don't need you don't need it. Just trust me today. I I have every bit of confidence in the writings of Daniel, and I think you can too. One of the things that when you come to prophecy, though, a lot of people do some really strange things with it, and there's some stuff that people do strange and wonderful, like with numerology and things. And as I was preparing for, I'm not into that stuff. I don't buy into that. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of validity there. Uh, but I did, as I was studying into Daniel chapter 2, I kind of came up with a pretty neat uh, discovery. Um, as you look in Daniel chapter 2, and, and I used my own little mathematical formula to find out that 2,600 years ago, look what Daniel predicted. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I actually knew that last week, too. So I was going to guarantee, last Sunday morning, I was going to guarantee that the Cavs would win. And if not, last Sunday's morning would have been free, but uh, sermon. But uh, you knew they were going to win anyhow. Daniel was a man of purpose. Remember in chapter 1, verse 8, Daniel resolved not to be defiled. He was com committed. He was all in to living a life that honored God. Now, he was in that group probably early on, they carried, got carried away out of Jerusalem, taken over to Babylon. Uh, it was right after uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a big victory there in Egypt, and he came through and started emptying some of his vassal states, and, um, and he was taking those then to uh, have in captivity in Babylon. Daniel defiled at that time, not, or he resolved not to defile himself, and, and it impacted the rest of his life. What we're going to look at here in chapter 2 takes place years later. And, and he made that purpose, and he wasn't going to let this hurt him or destroy him. And that's a good thing. We all need to have that inner purpose, but we also have to have a direction in life. Daniel was someone who was a man of prayer. And you know, it's useless to have commitments if we don't have that active dependency upon God. We need to do more than just um, make up our minds to try to do something. We need the help that only God can bring. So we're going to look at Daniel chapter 2. And some theologians have called this the alphabet of prophecy. I don't get the alphabet part, unless it's just because it's simple. But this is one that um, is a simple, comprehensive framework of what's going to happen in the future. So I'll read to you some of the verses. We're not going to cover all of them. Verse 1 through 2 says, In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, uh, I'll read verse 3, he said to them, I have a, had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Shakespeare once wrote, Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. Henry IV. Did that impress you, Kim? That's a good Shakespeare reference. So, Dr. Donald Campbell said, I think also is true, that the cares of the day becomes the cares of the night. Isn't that true? What you worry about in the daytime keeps you up at night and worries you. It says here that Nebuchadnezzar had these dreams and they troubled him. Now the Hebrew word troubled there means it was a deep disturbance that induced him to apprehension. He worried. 
he was quite frightful about this, and he didn't know what they meant. It troubled him. So he brought in some of his top advisors that he inherited from his father. He had, uh, it's interesting because I've read a couple translations of this, and there's different words that are used to describe who they are, but some of them don't even come close. So I'm going to use the King James and New International translations, and those don't come close. For instance, magicians. You and I think of, oh good, jugglers and people like that, card tricks. But actually, um, the word for magicians is, the root word is the word pen, as in you write something. And these are probably guys who are more the sacred writers, the scholars, the, the uh, scribes. The next word is astrologers. One translation says the conjurers. Um, it's really those who were the spiritualists. They're the ones who were the sacred priests that you and I would say, no, that's really freaky. They would communicate with the dead. They would be snake charmers and things like that. And then came the sorcerers. And again, the root of that word literally means to cut. You say, well, that's unusual. Well, what they did, they were very much involved in the occult, and they were the ones who would sell the herbs and the portions. They would, the potions, they would cut them up into little, they were drug dealers of their day. Nothing new, is it? And then there was the Chaldeans, who were actually Chaldeans. They came from the southern part of Babylon, and they were there, they were considered the wise men of, of the group. Anyhow, Let's summon all them and get them here. I'll read on from verse 4 to 9 and see what the challenge was. Then the astrologers answered, you know, he told them he wants them to tell them the dream. And they said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will interpret it. And the king replied to the astrologers, this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turn into piles of rubber. Rubble. Rubber, too. But, um, but if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. And once more they replied, let the king tell the servants the dream and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is just one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change, so then tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. Apparently, I think the king has been suspicious for, with them for some time. Remember I mentioned that um, Nebuchadnezzar inherited these people from his father. And I, I'm guessing that as Nebuchadnezzar and the kingdom prospered, some of these people took on themselves as though they were the reason why. See, we're the ones who are telling you what to do. We're the ones who, who are really behind all the success. It's interesting that when Nebuchadnezzar called him in, he called in this particular group. He didn't call in the younger guys, Daniel and, and his uh, partners. Um, but yet he does threaten this group that if you don't tell me the truth and you don't interpret this, tell me the dream and interpret the dream, I'm going to tear you from limb to limb. And you know what? They would have interpreted that literally. It was a very, very real threat. Now, last week I told you about some of the horrible things that he did to the kings of Judah and, and his sons. There were also stories about, well, I'll try to do this as gentle as possible. Did you ever do a pig roast? Only he used his enemies. Okay, that's enough to say about that. Well, it was a very real thing. Verse 10, they start putting in, says the astrologers answered the king, there's not a man on earth who can do what the king asked. No king, however great or mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asked is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among men. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. 
So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Ouch. This is getting, this is getting complicated. Their, their response was, he says to them, I had dreams, tell me what the dreams were, and then I'll believe your interpretation of it. And they, are said, they said, there is no one who can do that. No one can do that. No one can look into your mind and know what you were experiencing or thinking of. It kind of shows the bankruptcy of human wisdom, doesn't it? Nobody can do that. If I had a dream last night and I just said, hey, I had a dream last night, tell me what it was. You can't do that. None of us are capable of doing that. But you know what it does? It sets the stage for Daniel's God to do the impossible. And of course, he is able to do that. So we look then in chapters 14 and 18, and here comes this huge guarantee. The, the, the guys have been sent out, and we're going to kill all these people that were here. They're such phonies. And he knew it all along. He suspected that. We're going to kill them. We're going to kill them all. We're going to kill the new ones we have, the ones that are in training right now, including Daniel and his friends. Verse 14, when Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. And he asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. And at this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Wow. Daniel asked for an explanation. Here's this servant of the commander of the king, and he comes in, and he's now going to start gathering all the people, and he says, okay, now you guys are coming with me. What's up? Well, the king has issued an edict, and you're going to be put to death. Come on, let's go. And Daniel asked him why. And again, it just kind of illustrates how in, the, in this amount of time, Daniel has endeared himself to some of the leadership there because why would he need an explanation? He didn't have to give her an explanation, but he did. He told him what was going on. And Daniel asked for more time. He goes before the king, and as far as we know, this may have been his very first time ever appearing before King Nebuchadnezzar, but he goes before the king and asks for more time and guarantees that he'll give him the interpretation. He'll give him the dream and the interpretation. Now, the magicians and all that group, when they asked for more information, uh, Nebuchadnezzar accused them of using it as a stall tactic. And it would be real easy to say, well, Daniel's using this as a stall tactic. He wants to get out and consult with others and say, what are we going to do? But really what he wanted to do was he wanted not to stall, not to find answers, he wanted to go to his friends and ask them to pray. That's interesting. He trusted these people, and he knew that those three would pray along with him. And he said to them, let's pray and seek mercies. They desired that God and his mercy would intervene and rescue them. That's what he was praying for. In a sense... This becomes a selfish prayer. God wants us to pray. He wants us to pray. And, and selfish prayer or unselfish prayer, he wants us to pray to him. And he wants us to trust him to do the things that he has promised that he's going to do. In this particular prayer, there's three characteristics that are there. The first one is there's some exaltation of God. They exalt God. And then there's the divine intervention where Daniel and his friends are, are asking God to come and do the work that would save their lives. And then afterwards, there's going to be some worshipful praise. 
It's very possible that Daniel and his friends have been in captivity now for three years at this point, and it has not adversely affected them. They still trust God. Even in the midst of living in a very, very heathen culture, they're still trusting in their God to do the great things. Well, now we get into the prayer, and, and I've already told you in verse 19 that it says, God revealed that dream to Daniel. <clears throat> From verses 19 to 45 is the dream, the interpretation, the application, and, and I'm going to skip over that just because of time factors. I'm not going to read every verse there, but allow me to just give you some of the highlights of what's going on there. God unveils the secret of the king's dream to Daniel. The king didn't understand it, but God gives it to Daniel, and he's able to interpret it. There's a lot of symbolism in there, but it's pretty clear when it gives the interpretation of what it's about. Daniel has this vision during the night. They've been praying that God would reveal this, and while he's sleeping, there's a vision. And that vision is more than just a dream for Daniel. It's a supernatural revelation. Truth is given to him. Somehow the Lord reached into the king's innermost consciousness and, and during the king's sleep imparts a message to him and then God gives that same message and the same interpretation to Daniel later. And in this, in this vision, in this dream, God outlined the course of the centuries to come. This literally takes you well into the future, way, way into the future, thousands and thousands of years. All the centuries of the future are now going to be revealed to the king. Someone said that no dream before or since has ever revealed so much world history. That's true. They cover the entire period from Nebuchadnezzar until the very end of time. All of the future things were there. And just to tell you, this is really as fast as you can go through this. It talks about the kingdoms, Babylon, which of course is what Nebuchadnezzar is ruling over. But it also mentions the Medes and the Persians, where uh, King Dar uh, Darius is ruling over that. And then the Greek kingdom of Alexander the Great uh, is mentioned. And then the Romans uh, in the 5th century AD with Caesar ruling over that and, and expanding, which ends in the 5th century AD. And ultimately it takes us clear to the kingdom that Jesus Christ is going to establish. The kingdoms of the world are determined by God. God is the one who oversees history. God is the one who designs it. He, he rules it. He controls it. He is in sovereign control of everything. He knows not just who's going to be in rulership, but he picks and puts them there. It is remarkable as you read Daniel chapter 2 and you hear about those kingdoms and then you read your history books and see how faithfully the course of world history has followed that prediction. And if and even if you're one of the skeptics and say, well, I think it was a later writing, and I'll put it at 300 or 400, the kingdoms of Alexander the Greek and of Rome have more detail in here given to them uh, than even the others, and they all came true uh, verbatim. So, Daniel's first response was not one of relief, but it was one of worship. Now you would have, might, have, might have thought, I would have thought, that the death sentence is going to be removed. He gives the king the answer, the king withdraws the death sentence for him and his friends, and wow, what a relief that is. You know, that, that would have really solved the problem. But really what he did was he worship God. That was his first response. And the focus of his worship was that God is a God of power and God is a God of provision. Daniel never, only through this, ever takes the credit to himself. 
Wouldn't it have been so easy to just say, well, yeah, I kind of, I've done that before. Chapter 1 told us that we were kind of good at interpreting dreams and visions, and here I am again, doing it. It's, you know, not a big deal with me. I'm good at this. But instead, he praises the name of God, the character of God. He, he attributes to God wisdom and power, and he also recognizes that God is the one who determines the times and the seasons. He's in control of everything. He sets up and he just deposes of the kings. God is sovereign. He gives wisdom, knowledge, and discernment. God is able to reveal the deep, secret things, even dreams of people's minds and hearts. God knows what's in the darkness, but yet he is the light. Daniel gave all the praise to God. God is supreme over every other God. That's a pretty neat message. So then comes our response. You know, how do we respond when, when uh, things good happen in our lives? Uh, do you focus on the blessing or do you focus on the blesser? Do you think of the work or do you think of the Lord who did the work? Do you look at the answer to prayer or do you look to the one who answers the prayer to give God the credit and the glory? You know, those kings, those magicians and astrologers and all those groups, they were right. They were right when they said no mere mortal could do this. They couldn't fulfill the charge it was given. No human being could do that. That's right. The solution to that problem was with the God of heaven, not with the gods of Babylon. So we come to verses 46 through 49, and we see that there's some pretty good learning opportunities here for Daniel and his friends and for Nebuchadnezzar and for you and I. It says in verse, those verses, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel, and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and of revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler of the entire province of Babylon, and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Life is a little bit like the weather at times. Uh, there's always, there's times of high pressure, there's times of low pressure, but there's never times of no pressure. There's always something going on. So where's your focus during these times of great pressures upon you? Are you scrambling to protect yourself at all costs? That's what a lot of people do. Daniel did not. We need to ask God to showcase his presence in our lives. We want to line ourselves up with God's eternal purposes. And we want to honor him at all costs. Daniel was a man of purpose. Daniel was a man of prayer. His courage to live a life undefiled and his consistency of trusting God are both wonderful examples for us as we live in our foreign land of all kinds of strange and wonderful things around us. Would you join me in prayer? Father, how we thank you this day for your grace that is so abundant to us. Thank you for the, the amazing rule that you have over this world, even a world that is uh, as degenerate as ours is, and yet you are still in charge, you are still in control, you still do your great acts of work, and you want us to still worship and honor and trust you. Lord, help us to do that as we grow day by day, to, to enter into your courts with worship and praise and to live for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.